Hello, I'm Antonio D'Amico, this is Pointy Hat, and welcome to Tip of the Hat. That's right, we're back on our D&D advice train. I pick something people need help with, a new way to run the game, or whatever I feel like, we talk about it, and at the end I give you a fun goodie to help you on your way. I'm like an early game NPC that you mash through the dialogue box on your second playthrough. That's a sort of depressing way to look at it. I'm not gonna let my brain think too much about that. Let's get into it. Let me paint you a scene. You're DMing for your friends. You have found or cooked up a really cool, really flavorful monster. You cannot wait to use it in your games. You've been planning this guy's entrance for weeks. You reveal it to your players and the crowd goes... Tepid. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine. You can picture this guy appearing in front of your players and it being super scary and intimidating in your head, but your players just don't really care. Battle happens, they kill the baddie, and it's on to the next thing. You need help making bad guys actually scary, for threats to feel actually threatening and to give them weight. But how? Let's identify where this problem comes from. D&D is pretty hard to make scary. There are few to no visuals, and I have met few people that are like, actually scared of a mini with no context. Sound cues are either not possible or hard to pull off, and it's you on your lonesome describing a weird little guy holding a bread knife to your friends. And that's not the end of the issues. In a game like D&D, monsters get stale fast, not even accounting for the gremlin demon you have somehow foolishly allowed at your table that spends their time reading through the monster manual to find the monster you're running. Play D&D for a couple of years and you will know most monster manual monsters and their secrets. Learning that a troll heals itself every round until you inflict fire damage is a cool reveal and a neat mechanic. Once, then it's old hat. The players know what to do. If you have cool players at your table, they might spend one or two rounds pretending they don't know what to do so as to not metagame, but you know what they're doing, pretending. They don't actually feel scared. They're not confused or feel threatened. They are just being nice and good sports about it. And you don't want that. You want them to feel the threat, the peril, and the sense of accomplishment when they defeat a powerful foe that was scary and threatening. But how do we do that? How do we make our games, and specifically our monsters, scary? Okay, so before I get into the actual nitty-gritty of making monsters scary and setting up adventures with a sense of dread and real stakes, I need to get on my little soapbox and give you some advice about mise en scène, about the art of showmanship. In my experience, few DMs do this, and to me, and players like me, it literally makes all the difference. And this advice is not just for scary games, but for all games. Spend more time setting up the scene. No, not in game, in real life. Want your players to feel invested? Want them immersed in the story? Want to facilitate roleplay and your players embodying their characters? Want a hot body? Want a Bugatti? Want a Maserati? Well, I can assure you, it helps if you put some effort into presentation, so you better get to work. Grab some actually nice looking maps, light some incense, get some candles going, maybe invest in some LED lights that you can use whenever you're playing and change the colors. And by god, make a goddamn playlist that matches the mood of what you're going for. Playing D&D without music sends me up the wall. It's insane how much of a difference a soundtrack makes, at least to me. It's already pretty hard to get into the mind space of, I'm a three foot tall goblin that can cast spells with the power of personality because I made a deal with a mystical sugar daddy, and the place you're sitting at looking like a badly lit Quiznos on a Wednesday night does not make it easier. Do you play online? So do I. You can still play music, you can still make whatever VTT you're using look nice. I've used voice changes for weird sounding NPCs, I've invited bots into the voice chat that I've changed the names off when players have been surprised by someone, I've sent actual physical goods and letters to players' addresses, I've requested them to close their blinds and be in darkness, sit down, and get creative about it. Let me know if you want me to do a full video on this, because I could go on for hours, but the point I'm trying to make is, if you want to run a game and make your players actually scared and invested and threatened, it helps to set up a space that accommodates that. I often hear DMs complain that their players are not invested, or ask how they can make people get more into character and roleplay, and I wonder how much a bit of effort when it comes to setting up a scene and sprucing up the environment in which you play could help everyone in this regard. At the very least, lower the lights and put some music. It will make a world of difference, believe me. Okay, I'm done with a soapbox. Let's get back to monsters. So the problem is that monsters feel samey. They get stale quick once you play for a while and they don't feel threatening in the same way that video game mobs don't feel threatening. Monsters end up feeling like punching bags, a video game obstacle to beat down and proceed to the next checkpoint. Just an interchangeable set of stats and abilities. So what can we do to change this. Well, I have a little method with which you can get not only a cool, new, flavorful monster, but also an entire adventure based on them. I call it the creature feature method. But before we get into it, let me tell you a story. After walking the fairgrounds during the Harvest Festival, your party sees a small tent made of purple-tinted canvas. No sign up front. 
just a golden eye painted on the flaps that serve as its entrance. As you step inside, the smell of incense hits your nose, and the laughing and shouting of the fair goers outside becomes muffled, as if smothered by the cloth walls of the tent. Lit by the fire of a flickering candle, a figure clad in a hooded robe sits in front of a small table. The figure extends a hand, inviting you to sit. You do so instantly, almost as if this was not an invitation, but a command. The figure extends their other hand, and they hold something in this one. A deck of cards. Then, with a flick of the hand, they take one card and flip it. And you watch in awe as the card comes to life in front of your very eyes. Imagine actually doing that at the table. That'll be sick. Well, you don't have to imagine it because animated tarot cards are a thing and Hitpoint Press is sponsoring this video to let me tell you all about them. The Fable Maker animated tarot deck is actually that, an actual physical deck of tarot cards that actually moves in real life. It's magic. The Fable Maker animated tarot deck is in fact not technically magical and uses lenticular technology to achieve the effect of drawn pictures coming to life and moving on the card. Ask your personal divination wizard about the Fable Maker animated tarot deck. But Pointy, my parents were not hippies, so I don't know what a tarot is, nor do I know how to use it. Well, that's why you can get the animated tarot deck and the Fable Maker's tarot guidebook to put the magic of tarot into your D&D games. That's right, you can get just the tarot deck or or the guidebook that teaches you not only how to use tarot, but how to put tarot into D&D for that extra magical effect. The Fable Maker's tarot guidebook enhances your beloved 5e classes with tarot and much, much more. It even has NPCs for all major arcana. So Persona fans, this one is for you. Get them social links ready. If all of that sounds fun, which I, I think it does, the art looks so gosh and pretty, I really want it. You can go right now to the link in the description and get the Fable Maker tarot deck, the Fable Maker guidebook, or a box set that includes both and looks even prettier. Check the description for it and all that. In the creature feature method of monster and adventure design, you make the monster the focus of the adventure you are running with the goal of making the monster feel unique and threatening to your players. I don't use this method just for horror, by the way. You can very much use this to make all monsters feel unique and the spotlight of an adventure, regardless of the tone you're going for. Now, you may be wondering, what's up with that name? Well, I love cryptids, so I structured this entire method around what I feel makes them awesome. We're going to use what makes urban legends and word of mouth campfire stories awesome and immersive in our D&D games. And we're going to do it with three pillars because pillars are very internet friendly and people love counting on YouTube videos. It calms them down or whatever. First pillar, horror. If you want your monster to not only be spooky, but also scary, it helps if you know what way you want them to be scary. As I said, this method can be used for enemies and adventures that are not horror themed, but all villains are threatening. So let's talk a bit about horror and the different ways something can be scary. There's much written about the horror genre and the different subgenres contained within. And I'm not here to read off of Watch Mojo's top 10 types of horror. You can do that on your own. What you need to do is determine how this monster is going to be scary. Are they a twist on a benevolent concept? Are they the embodiment of something that could happen to you, to your body, to your mind? Are they a reflection of the potential for evil that we all carry inside? Horror is extremely broad, but true fear is in specificity. If all your monsters are supposed to be scary because they look spooky and could hurt you, I can assure you no player at your table is actually going to feel threatened even a little bit about that. So this pillar is here for you to find exactly why your monster is supposed to be scary. Cracking open one of those fishing websites that appear on the front page of Google nowadays when you look up anything to see all the possible horror subgenres is a good start, but I would challenge you to start thinking about something that you find scary specifically. I'm sure you can think of something better than clowns. Keep going. Let's dig deep past whatever the internet has told us we should be scared of this week. I'll get more into this later, but horror is subjective. So in my experience, it's better to come from a personal place when trying to elicit the feeling of fear rather than try and guess what others find scary about something you don't personally find scary. Once you have it, it's time to move on to the second pillar story. This is the most important one, and the reason why this is called the Creature Feature Method. Creature features were a type of TV programming that were most popular during the 70s and 80s, where they showed cult horror movies that most of the time revolved around a monster. So think of horror stories, urban legends, campfire tales. Why is it that all those horror stories are not just one long description of whatever monster the story is about? Well, they are if you're looking at 98% of creepypastas, but that's why they're bad. The point of putting a monster into a story is because it becomes 10 times scarier if there's a story to this thing. Your monsters are not scary because they are lacking context, making the swamp where the hack lives spooky is fine, I guess. It's like step one. But if your players have traversed the treacherous spooky swamp, which means they have rolled three survival checks in a row and maybe fallen down once or twice. Now that's what I call riveting, fun, engaging gameplay. And then the hag just appears out of nowhere. She's just there vibing and a fight starts. I mean, how could they possibly be scared of that? How would they actually get into the story and feel like they're there when there's no story to get into? But imagine if the party comes to a town that has had a horrible string of bad luck. They ask around and start piecing together what has 
has been happening. Cattle turn up dead, water supplies are poisoned, grain in the silo is infested with mold, people have even started to go missing. After some investigation, talking to some folks in the village, the party finds out that so far no children have been harmed, which the village sees as the silver lining of their unlucky streak. But that's when the party overhears children speaking to each other about who will be chosen to go and play next. Slowly, they uncover that the children of the village believe that one of them gets picked every night to go to an incredible magical playground, and they all eagerly await their turn. But if they want to come back to the magical playground, the lady that runs it asks them for little favors, and the favors get darker and darker. And soon the party finds out that those behind all the problems in the village are actually the children, who are being led by a hag to do terrible things in the hope that they'll be picked by her to go to the playground, which turns out to be just a hallucinatory terrain spell. Now there is something to get into. Now this monster has gone from a video game mob to a deeply disturbing nefarious figure, and all that because we have given them a story. When working on your own monster for this pillar, ask yourself, who is this monster? How did they come to be? What do they do? And why do they do it? And be specific about it. They do evil things is not gonna cut it. This isn't the monster manual. Above all, what do other people know of this monster? Is it an established presence in these parts? Do only a select group of people know of them? Are there legends about the monster? Are these legends true or greatly exaggerated? You are building actual folklore about a monster, and your party is injected with all this context about the creature you're presenting to them, and they see how this creature affects the world around it. Now, getting to actually see the monster and fight it is gonna have so much more weight to it, and that's because we gave it a story. Okay, so now that we have the type of horror that we're trying to convey and the monster story, time for our last pillar, mystery. This one is tricky to understand and to get right, so it might require some trial and error. This pillar is not about adding more information to your monster, but actually about taking information away. If you've watched enough horror movies, you know the feeling I'm about to describe. The build-up to the creature is terrifying. You might see a hand, a silhouette here and there, a flash of it in the distance, and then it's shown to you in full a couple of times and the fear kind of uh, disappears. <laughs> Here's the thing about creature-based horror. The more the creature is explained and understood, the less scary it is. But the less context there is about the creature, the less scary it is too. We have a tightrope situation on our hands. You want to explain enough so that the creature has a story, but not too much so that the creature becomes mundane. We need to create a sense of mystery around the creature. I told you that in the story pillar you should be very thorough, ask yourself the necessary questions and answer them, think about every possible thing you could think of about your monster. Well, during the mystery pillar you get to decide how and if those pieces of information are revealed. Maybe you explain who this creature once was, but you don't explain how they came to be. Maybe you explain what the creature does, but not why they do it until the end. It's about giving enough information for the players to fill in the blanks with whatever their brains find scarier. This is human impulse. We all do this, so let them do that. Let them come up with what would actually scare them the most about this creature, because if you try to fill every blank, you will never be quite as scary as whatever they came up with. And there you go. That's the creature feature method of monster and adventure making. As you can see, using these three pillars will basically give you not just a monster that actually has impact at the table and feels like a tangible threat that lives and breathes in whatever world you have created, but also basically a whole adventure for you to run. But talk is cheap and my videos are 20 minutes long at this point, so how about I use my very own method to create my very own monster and show you how I go about it using the creature feature method. Okay, let's go for the first pillar, horror. So horror is very personal and as I said I believe that going for something you personally find scary will always yield better results than you trying to make something that other people find scary but you don't. This doesn't mean you should go for something extremely niche. Try to go for something slightly universal. Like because of some dark childhood trauma, you have a horrible phobia of lion green jello, that might not be the way to go for something that is supposed to scare your table and not just you. So let's see which one of my personal fears we will be exposing today. Spin the roulette! Ah. That one. So one of my biggest fears is frogging. No, not with an F, with a PH. Frogging is the act of someone living in your house without your knowledge. I'm not talking about rich people that barely ever go to one of their seven summer homes finding out that someone is living in one they haven't used since 1988. I'm talking a person literally living in the place you live without you knowing. Hiding in your attic, in the vents, in a closet you don't use often, and coming out when you're away, or worse, sleeping and kind of living their life, eating your food, hastily hiding behind your couch as you get up at 4 a.m. to go to the fridge and eat shredded cheese out of the bag. This happens in real life. I was writing this script at 3 a.m. and I had to look in every closet in my house and now I'm recording this and I'm terrified and I have to do it again or else I won't sleep tonight. It's the scariest fucking thing to me, oh God. Okay, so why is that scary to me? Well, it's the fear of a space, an activity, something you felt was safe and sacred and yours that turns out not to be safe at all. That's terrifying! We all sort of understand that there are places with different degrees of safety, and 
home is, ideally, the safest place of all. And it's ours and only ours. And if someone takes that away for an extended period of time, that's terrifying. Okay, I got my horror pillar. Let's make a monster based on that and try to convey that fear to our players. Time for our second pillar, story. So if our horror is safety turned into danger, what is safety to adventurers in D&D? Well, not a place, since adventurers move around way too much for home to be that place for the players. Yes, I understand that you scribble down that your PC comes from Fantasy Village, working title, and that they love it very much, and that their unnamed mother and father and little sister are waiting for them or whatever, but that's the character, not the player. The character might think of their hometown as their safe place, but the player doesn't. And what we want is to awaken emotions in our players. So we gotta go for what players see as safety within the game. And there's only one place to look for that. And that's not even a place, but an activity. Rest. My monster is going to simply be called the Restless. Restless are called that because they're physically unable to sleep or rest. They are not required to sleep to stay alive or to even stave off exhaustion, but they feel the same psychological need to rest as any other living creature, but they are unable to do so naturally. There's only one way for the Restless to acquire their much needed respite, and it's through stealing it from others. The Restless spend the majority of their wretched existence in the ethereal realm. And from there, they are able to steal rest from those who are sleeping. The Restless siphon the sucker from those in the material realm, gaining it for themselves. It's said that they prefer to steal from those that need rest the most, so those healing from wounds or illnesses are particularly prone to a Restless attack. What's more, the Restless develop a bond with their victims after consuming their sleep, meaning they are more likely to continue siphoning out sleep from the same creature until the victim passes from exhaustion. Some people try to flee from a restless attack by traveling, hoping to leave the creature behind. This is an often futile endeavor, as the restless can teleport anywhere a creature it has fed from has rested in the last 24 hours. This requires the victim to be constantly moving, ironically unable to ever settle and rest, as the restless can use any bed, any tent, any campfire their victim has rested at to move ever closer to their source of succor. Physically, the restless look gaunt and well, sleep deprived, of course. Their eyes cannot physically blink as they lack eyelids. Restless take to covering them with their hands and makeshift bandages. But every time one of their eyes is covered for an extended period of time, a new one grows elsewhere on their body, ensuring they can never truly rest. In an ironic and terrifying twist, those that die of exhaustion caused by a restless are not allowed to even rest in death, as they rise as new restless themselves mentally exhausted from the constant pursuit from the restless that killed them, forced to inflict this on someone else, robbing another person of the peace that comes with sleep. Pretty spooky. The Restless use the horror of a creature that haunts you at the moment where you feel more secure, turning it into the moment where they are most vulnerable. It heavily borrows from other horror tropes, such as the tireless pursuer of It Follows and more curse-centric haunts like The Ring and all. Plenty of context for this monster to exist and actually terrify your players, I would say. With that, it's time to move on to the last pillar, mystery. This one heavily depends on the adventure you want to run. Maybe starting out, the players know very little, just that people have been developing acute cases of insomnia in the city, some even passing away from it. Then, as the adventure moves forward, they find out more about those people and how they all passed while trying to sleep in their beds or huddled around a fire. Then, as they find out more about the monster, they learn more information, but not all of it. They know it attacks unseen, so they might believe it's invisible and not that it lives in a completely different plane of reality. They might believe it can move through walls, but are not aware that it actually teleports between places of rest. Maybe they try and fail to save a beloved NPC from dying from the feeding of a restless, and that's when they realize that those that die from the exhaustion it causes come back as restless themselves. It's about drip feeding the information to give enough context for the monster to be scary, while not revealing all your cards at once and killing the mystery. Okay, I would say that's a pretty solid application of the creature feature method to create a monster. I think the only monster I'm aware of that sort of has a similar ability is the Night Hag, but she has like a thousand other things going on, including being a fiend. I would say the restless is much more thematic, and in my opinion, much more spooky than the hag. Although y'all know how I love me some spooky hags. And for adventures, I'm already thinking of so many possible adventures you can run with this tired, tired boy. I explicitly made it so that the restless prefers to steal from those that need it most. And who needs rest more than adventures? How many times does your party plop down from a rest battered and bruised, HP in the single digits, ready to finally relax and gain back that HP? And then they wake up in the morning feeling just as awful, their wounds just as open. They keep traveling, and the restless travels along with them in the ethereal 
plane, the party remaining completely oblivious to its advances, following them after every short rest, slowly draining the life from one of your party members. How do they deal with that threat? You could increase the horror as the visions of the restless start to become more vivid in the dreams of the one it's haunting, as they get closer and closer to death by exhaustion. Make it real spooky. Or if you don't want to target one of the members of your party, how about meeting an eccentric lord that lives in a constantly moving zeppelin that travels the world, never staying in one place for more than a couple of hours, only to find out that the lord has been haunted by a restless hell-bent on feeding from his rest for years. Imagine the reward he would give them, but also imagine the sort of powerful restless the one haunting the lord would be if it has been actively chasing him for this long. It's just a shame that this cursed, cursed man lives only in my little brain. You would have to come up with a stat block, balancing, not to mention actually writing everything about the creature feature method down if you want to use it yourself. That would be a ton of work you would have to do. But guess what? You don't, because I did it. You can find the restless stat block along with the illustration I made, as well as rules to use the creature feature method clearly written for you to use in your own monster making in the description of this very video for absolutely 100% certified free. So go out there, examine your deepest fears and harness them to make your players have a bad time. And welcome! It's the end! We did it! I know what you're thinking, this is hardly a December themed video and you'd be right, it isn't. I just felt spooky again, and spooky isn't seasonal, so I'm allowed to get spooky at Christmas time. And I would recommend you do too. I plan on having a more thematically appropriate video somewhere in December, we'll see. Alright, if you made it this far, first of all thank you, and second of all, comment telling me what personal fear you would use to make a monster using my creature feature method. I'm really interested in see what you come up with. Alright, I have a ton of Christmas planning to do, so I'm gonna get into that. I'll see y'all very soon, make sure to to behave so you don't end up on Santa's kinky list. Why did I say that? Let's move on past that. Goodbye! Mwah.